It is the prerogative of God alone to prescribe the duty of men and angels. The will of God is a perfect will and must be obeyed as it is set forth in his holy law, because every requirement is just and is set forth by infinite wisdom. The law of God should be obeyed even though there were no authority to enforce it and no reward for its obedience. The highest interests of men and angels are conserved in obeying the law of God. God's will expressed in his law is the supreme will, and no invention, no device of man can take its place. Obedience to the commandments of men instead of to the commandments of God will be abomination in the sight of God. For what God requires is essential to the highest good of his subjects and is therefore essential for the glory of God. Signs of the Times, September 24, 1894. Paragraph 4. It's a very powerful statement. L.O.I. tells us God's law is so good. We should keep it even if, even if there were no reward for keeping it. Even if there were no eternal life, no heaven, the best life is still a life lived in harmony with God's law. But we thank God there's a heaven, there's a new earth, and there's eternal life where God's law will reign supreme. How are you? We thank God for bringing us thus far on this holy day. It's astonishing to think that most of the world does not regard the seventh-day Sabbath. Most of the world. But if you study the Bible carefully, it's uh, 20 after 4, God has never had the majority on his side. He has Never. It's, it's tragic that Satan has always carried the majority. Even though God said he's not willing that any should perish, and we know the devil comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy, he always carries the majority with him. It must just cause pain in the heart of a loving God to see his children go the way of the enemy. But your presence in this house tells me that you love truth. If I'm right, say amen. amen. And uh, truth alone will set us free. Truth alone will sanctify us. And truth alone will cause us to be identified with truth itself and himself, which is Jesus Christ. Is there anyone joining us this afternoon? You weren't here this morning. May I see your hand? You were not here this morning. <laughs> May I see your hand? <laughs> oh, hi. God bless you. What's your name? Sister? Leola is a good name. How are you, Sister Leola? Where were you this morning? That's a good place to be. Good, good. <laughs> we're glad you ran away this afternoon. Okay. Anybody else? You weren't here this morning. Our pastor, yes. We welcome you, Pastor. We admit you to fellowship. Thank you for being with us. <laughs> the pastor's a busy man. He has more than one church. Like the Apostle Paul, he had so many churches, and the care of the church is a burden on him all through his life, Paul. But we thank God. Pastor, nice to see you. Anybody else? Okay. Ah, yes, my good brother, good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. God bless you. Anybody else? You ah, God bless you. What church are you from? Which one? Far West End. Far West End. How far is that? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, just from the West. Okay. <laughs> He's a gunslinger from the West. Okay. Good to have you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God's people are all over the place. By the way, this earth enjoys a level of security because of God's people. Mm. Remove God's people and this world would perish immediately. The reason why God's mercy still lingers, he has people on this earth. I wish the unbelievers would understand that and stop harassing God's people. It is because of God's people this earth has not yet been consumed and destroyed. When God sent the angels to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot told the angel that he wanted to go to a little city. 
The angel says, see, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow this city for the which thou hast spoken. Haste thee, be gone, for I cannot do anything until thou be fit. In other words, I cannot destroy why you are standing here. Why? Because you're a righteous man. And Abraham told God in Genesis 18, will thou destroy the righteous with the wicked? You can't do that. I was on a plane flying somewhere from somewhere else. And uh, this lady sat next to me. <laughs> and she looked at me. I was dressed in a suit in my uniform. And she, uh, she said, what do you do? I said, I'm a preacher. She said, oh, I'm so glad to sit next to you. I said, why? She said, because of turbulence. <laughs> when the plane starts to do that, I want to be next to a preacher. <laughs> so this world is in for some turbulence. Are you with me? Get next to a child of God. Can you say amen? Mm -hmm. Because plagues do not fall on God's people. Mm. All right. Our subject for this brief presentation is the family of God. What did I say? The family of God. What three favors do I always ask you? What's favor number one? Turn off these if you're not using them. If you're using them, turn them down. If you're not, kill them until they're dead. Okay. Favor number two, what's that? Pray for me, yes, sincerely. Simply say to God, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. What text do I usually use? Jeremiah 1 verse 9, which says what? Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. What's favor number three? Think. Have you been thinking? If you have, you ought to be making some decisions. Every time you listen to a sermon that's biblical, make decisions. Respond. It may be the last sermon you ever listened to. Every time. Truth, the response may be, recommit the life to God. The response may be, give up this behavior or start doing something I should have been doing. The response may be, go tell someone I'm sorry for what I did or go forgive someone for doing something to you. Every time truth touches you, respond. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you very much for a week of truth. Thank you for the faithful attendance of your people. The attendance wasn't large numerically. It was large in consistency. And I thank you, dear God, for the high honor of speaking for you. As I stand in your presence, I ask you, Father, grant me a measure of your spirit sufficient to the task and then a little extra. If I've offended you, forgive me, dear God. Cleanse me and use me effectively. Let your spirit consistently whisper in my ear the glory of God, the glory of God. Bless those watching online, Father. Stretch your elastic arm and touch them. Draw them to your bosom. Let the words I speak be your words, I pray. In Jesus' name, let God's people say, Amen and Amen. Go with me to John 17. John 17. It's 25 after 4. I'll be done by 5. Then we go right into question and answer. John 17. I recommend this chapter very, very highly. The entire chapter. This is Christ praying to the Father. And Bible scholars call it the high priestly prayer. And the disciples are listening. The disciples, of course, minus Judas. They're listening to Jesus Christ as he prays, right after that prayer, Christ goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. In verse 11, let me read from verse 9. Read with me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. Stop. John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world. Jesus tells us in John 17, 5, 9, as he prays to the Father, I pray for them. I pray not for the world. On that discreet occasion, Christ was praying only for the disciples. Who was Christ? God. Here is God praying for his disciples. Are you with me? 
I pray for them. I pray not for the world. Now he goes on to make a distinction between them and the world. Let's go to verse 14 of John 17. I have given them thy word. Come on. And the world hath hated them. Why? Because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Now stop. Think. What do you understand by even as? I heard it. The same way. The same way. The human Jesus and we are to look the same way. Listen to Christ. They are not of the world e the same way that I am not of the world. Now, listen to verse 15. I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, finish the verse, but that thou shouldst keep them from the evil. And so Jesus says, yes, Father, they are in the world physically. They live in that neighborhood. They live in what? They live in Philly. They live wherever. But they are not of that place. Amen. Having met me, now they're from above. The same way I am from above. My disciples are from above. Go to John 8, 23. Read that for me. I think it's John 8, 23. I'm guessing on this verse. Just popped into my head. John 8, 23. Brother Ian, you're always my loudest reader. Do we have John 8, 23? What does that say? Said it to them. Ye are from beneath. I am from above. Ye are of this world. I'm now, let's think of that and let's add that to John 17, 15, uh, 14. Jesus said unto them, ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye of this world, I am not of this world. Then he tells us of the disciples, they are not of this world, even as I am not of this world. He could have said, they are from above. What's our subject? Don't do that to me on the final day. What's our subject? The family of God. <laughs> Where are we from? Quickly. Too slow, too slow. Where are we from? Quickly. From above. Why? Because we're in Christ. Somebody say amen. We are from above. So we don't get caught up in earthly things. <laughs> are you listening to me? Go to Philippians 3. Philippians chapter 3. Let's read verse 20. When you found it, say amen. amen. Read with me. For our conversation is in heaven. Stop. Who has a different translation from the King James? What does it say? Our citizenship is where? That's not symbolic language. Let me ask you this. Is Jesus real or is he symbolic? Real. He's real. Is he really in heaven? Yes. Are we really in him? Yes. Where's our citizenship? In heaven. That's literal. We cannot walk in this earth as though our citizenship is on this earth. If it is, it is secondary. Go to John 18.36. You're looking at me strangely. John 18.36. Let's add verse to verse to verse. And then you realize these are not my opinions. John 18.36, the family of God. Listen to what Jesus tells Pilate. Do you have John 18.36? What does Jesus say? My kingdom is not of this world. Pause. My disciples are not of this world. I, come on. He said in John 8, 23, I am not of this world. He said in John 17, 14 and 16, my disciples are not of this world. Now he tells us in John 18, 36, my kingdom is not of this world. Then he tells us one of the effects of being a citizenship of a citizen of heaven. Let's keep reading verse 36. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, come on, then would my disciples fight 
that I should not be delivered unto thee, but now is my kingdom, come on, not from hence. The reason why my disciples are not picketing and protesting you, Pilate, is because they are citizens of a different country. In that country, we don't do that. Is this mic working? <laughs> you didn't get it. No, you didn't get it. You're just being nice because you're nice people, but you didn't get it. Listen to Jesus again. Read verse 30. You read it for me if you have my version. Come on. Jesus answered, said what? My kingdom is not of this world. Stop. Now, you either have world or heaven. In the beginning, God created. Mm -hmm. It's either of this earth or it's from heaven. My kingdom is not of this earth. Keep reading. If kingdom were of this world, come on, then fight that I not be delivered. Mm -hmm. But now is my kingdom. In other words, the family of God does not behave like the rest of the world in times of crisis. We do not engage in violence, not even to defend the heavenly kingdom. We engage in obedience. Are you a citizen of God's kingdom? Mm -hmm. Let's go back to John 17. Verse 15, our subject, the family of God. This is your last day to tell me, slow down. My good brother, you let me down this afternoon. You haven't told me, slow down. All right. Okay. <laughs> My brother has a sign. He says, slow down. <laughs> Blessings upon you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Let me pray again. Father, thank you for this joyful occasion. Truly help me to slow down so the message is not damaged. In Jesus' name, come on. Amen and amen. John 17, we go 14 all the way to 16. Are you ready? Read with me. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them. Let's pause. The word, the world does not like truth. The world does not like the Sabbath truth. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them. Why? Because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. 15. I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but that thou shouldst keep them from the evil. Jesus was from Nazareth, and the common saying was, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Jesus was proof something good can come out of Nazareth. Regardless of your neighborhood, you cannot blame your neighborhood for how you behave. Because your neighborhood does not make choices for you. I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but that thou shouldst keep them from the evil. Verse 16, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. He repeats the sentiment. I say again, in all matters related to this world, God's people should function differently. Our schools should be run differently. Our hospitals should be run differently. Our publishing houses should be run differently. Our children should be raised differently. Why? Come on, why? Because we are not, come on, of this world. And this is literal. Now we are physically on the earth. What does the Bible say? If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above. That's how our father Abraham lived. Gen uh, not Genesis, Hebrews 11, verse 8. He looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. While he lived in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise, Hebrews 11 verse 9, but he looked for a city. His mind 
was on that city to come. As he moved from place to place in a temporary tent, he anticipated a permanent city, a building with a foundation does not move. Abraham is our father. Jesus says that spiritually. We ought to be like Abraham. Our minds in heaven, our feet on the earth. We just read 16. Let's read 17 of John 17. What does that say? Say it without looking. Come on, look up, look up, look up. Say it. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is true. What does it mean to sanctify? To spiritually cleanse. To remove further and further from this world. Further and further. So that we literally do not belong. Let's go to verse 18. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. Let me point out a, a relationship that you might have missed. Read verse 14 again. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them. Why? Because they are not of the world, even as I. So we have Christ and the believer. They are the same in this not being part of the world. Let's go to verse 18. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them. So as the Father sent the Son, we have Jesus sending the believer. We have that relationship. You see, the relationship between Father and Son should be reflected in the relationship between Christ and the believer. Amen. Look at John 15, 10. Oh, let's read John 15, 9 and 10. See the same relationship. John 59, read with me if you have it. Not, As the Father hath loved me, stop. We have Jesus and the Father. As means what? The same, the same way the Father hath loved me, keep reading, so have I loved you. Stop. So we have again, Father, Son. This must be reflected in Christ believer. Read verse 10. See the same thing again. If ye keep my commandments, believe in Christ, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love, Father and Son, Christ believer. Let me say it again, even I've said it over and over. The relationship between the Father and the Son in a heavenly family must exist between the Savior and the believer. If that's the case, then surely we are members of the heavenly family. Do you know that when you were worshiping this morning, and we are now, we are only an extension of the church in heaven? A few months ago, my wife and I went to Hawaii. I had an assignment there. And... Um, I was surprised the flight was nine hours. I said, wait a minute, this is the United States. Why is it nine hours? <laughs> then it struck me, Hawaii is way off from the mainland. Nine hours from Detroit to Honolulu. I thought I was flying to the Philippines. But Hawaii is a state of the United States. Are you with me? A state. To get to Alaska, you've got to go through Canada if you're driving. If you're flying, you, fall over, you fly over Canadian airspace. But Alaska is a state of the United States. The Petersburg SDA Church is a state of the heavenly church. Amen. Pastor Jesse is an assistant to Jesus. Come on, give me a louder amen. amen. <laughs> so when you mess with him, you mess with Jesus. <laughs> It may stick right here, but still, mm-hmm. <laughs> Are you following me? <laughs> this church on earth is an extension of the church in heaven. Basically, God doesn't have two churches. He may have two branches, but one church. You follow me? Two branches, one church. Now, Christ is praying 2,000 years ago. For whom was he praying? The disciples. Were you there? No. Come on, were you there? No. Was he praying for you? Yes. 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 Does the Bible say that? Yes. Where? <laughs> Go to verse 20. 
I like when you look confused. It's so nice. <laughs> John chapter 17, verse 20. Go there with me. And I hope someone will say hallelujah when you read verse 20. Do you have it? Read with me. Neither pray I for these alone. Come on. But for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Mm -hmm. Isn't that you? Yes. 2,000 years ago, Jesus prayed for Michael Farmer and Joanne Farmer. He prayed for Ian. He prayed for the pastor. He prayed for Sister Rice. 2,000 years ago. Doesn't that give you some comfort? Some assurance? You're in good hands with all heaven? <laughs> Are you with me? <laughs> Not all state. You're in good hands with all heaven. The family of God, covered by God. And when Jesus prays for you, what does the Father say? He has a choice between yes and no. What does the Father say? Yes. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Now read verse 21. Come on, nice and loud. That they all may be one, come on, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee. That they also may be one in us, and that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Stop. This is a tremendous verse. That they all may be what? One. one. Regardless of color, education, economics. Connections, physical appearance, one. Now, we look around society, we don't see that. So the church believes it can't happen. Because the church doesn't look up, it looks down. We don't see the races getting along or the ethnic groups, so it can't get along in the church. But when you look up, you have to think differently. That they all may be one. As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee. Christ is saying, <laughs> the Bible makes some statements sometimes, we have to shake our heads. And we do not understand the privilege God has in store for us. We must be one. The way the Godhead are one. But notice what he says. That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee that there also may be one in us. And so I in you, you in me, and they in us. Now listen to Ellen White. Comfort and Courage, page 21, paragraph 5. What did I say? Page 21, paragraph 5. God created man for his own glory, that after test and trial, the human family might become one with the heavenly family. Now explain that to me. Here's divinity, here's humanity, and God's intention was to combine them. And he'll still do it at some point in eternity. This is astonishing. The Bible says, for thou hast made him how? A little lower than the angels. But when that combining is done, ah, we cannot imagine the results to God's created beings. Of course, we won't be God. I've told you that before. But that combination will produce a group of people that are above angels themselves. The family of God. But for now, I want you to look at verse 21 again, that they all may be one. Verse 22, what does that say? And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them. We see that relationship again. What the Father gave to Jesus, he gives to the believer. What's that glory? Character. Finish the verse. That they all may be one, come on, even as we are one. The just shall live how? By faith. Do you believe that? You need not answer me, but do you believe that? We on this earth can be one. 
the way Jesus and the Father are one. Read verse 23. What does that say? I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Ah, that's putting the cherry on the cake. God the Father loves you. Finish my words. As much, come on, as he loves Jesus. Ella White explains. God loves the obedient disciple. As he loves his son. I should be quiet a while. Let you think of that. My friends online. God loves the disciples who obey his commands. As he loves his son. She goes on to say, how amazing is this statement? Almost beyond the comprehension of the finite mind. That God can love you as much as he loves Christ. Go to John 10. Talk about the love of God. Go to John 10. There are some mysteries in the Bible. We're about to read one. There are some things I accept without understanding how they work. That applies to natural things like gravity... Therefore, it can apply to the Bible. Do you have verse 17 of John 10? Father, continue to be with me, I pray, please, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's read 16, then go to 17. Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Carefully now, therefore doth my Father love me. Why? Because I lay down my life that I might... Mm -hmm. Now, look at that verse again. There's something astonishing, astounding, and amazing. What does Jesus say? Therefore, because of this, my Father loves me because I give up my life for the, my people. Didn't the Father love him before that? Yes. Yeah. What Christ is saying, the Father's love deepened. And Ella White comments on that and says that. The father loved him more. How is that possible? I don't know. Because he gave up his life, the father loved him more. All right. Can God love you more? Can we demonstrate more of that love? Yes. It is mind-blowing. In uh, the Zara of Ages, page 761, paragraph 5, writing of Lucifer, Elohite says, To him, as to no other created being, was given a revelation of God's love. Lucifer understood God's love in a way no other angel understood because God gave him a direct and exclusive revelation of the depth of his love. No other angel had that. Let me put this to you as we continue the family of God. Go to John 14 and think with me. John 14. Let's read... Verse 15, you know it very well. Come on, look up, look up, look up and say it. If you love me, keep my commandments. All right, we have love, we have commandments. All right, now, go to verse 21. Read with me. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. Stop. There is a general love God has for the world. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He has a deeper love for those who obey. Desire of Ages, page 524, paragraph 1. Interesting statement. Ella White writes, Christ loves all the human family. No, Christ blessed all those who sought his help. The Savior blessed those who sought his help. He loves all the human family. But 
to some. He's bound by peculiar, peculiarly tender associations. His heart was bound by a strong bond of affection to the family at Bethany. Name them. Mary, Martha, and for one of them, his most wonderful work was wrought. Lazarus, mm, resurrection. Christ reserved his most magnificent miracle for the family closest to him. And the Bible makes it very clear. The foundation of closeness to God is plain and simple. O B E. Come on. Obedience. That is why the family of God is distinguished by its obedience to God. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Finish the verse. Which keep the commandments of God. Revelation 14, 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. But let us not forget that they all may be one. As we are one. Petersburg SDA Church family and guests. Until this church becomes one, Christ cannot come. He cannot come to take to heaven a divided people. Because the divisions in us will uh, translate to heaven. That can happen. We have to be heavenly creatures on earth before we physically step into heaven. Let me say it differently. Heaven must be in us before we get into heaven. Amen. Between Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, there's no conflict. There's no division. Except on Calvary. And that was for us. When the Father turned away, because the son was covered with what? The sins of the world. And Jesus felt the separation. And he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Elohim said, The father said, That will never happen again. Amen. She said, There was a sundering. It's like taking his, this is a bulletin, can I tear this? And, uh, it hurt the father. And the Son and the Spirit. The Father said, This will never, ever happen again. Iniquity shall not rise the second time. God is preparing a people to live in a sinless world. We have to practice now. You do not practice sin to get ready for sinless world. It makes no sense spiritually or secularly. You don't practice basketball in order to play baseball. Are you with me? To prepare for a sinless world, by the grace of God, we practice sinlessness. Moment by moment, day by day, we're growing and the sinlessness begins here or here. In other words, my mind is made up. I want to hate sin so much. I prefer death over sin. It's here. Then it comes out day by day. But it's here. I have a perfect desire to obey God. Now I have to express that by the grace of God. And so you grow. You grow. You grow towards the outward fulfillment of what is in here. In every acorn, there is an oak. But it's expressed gradually, gradually, gradually. My brothers and sisters, we are the family of God. God's kingdom is not, finish my words, of this world. Then we must not be of this world. We must not see the world, see things the way the world sees things. We must not react to calamities the way the world reacts because we see things through God's eyes. In the sight of God. Not the sight of one philosophy or one party agenda. We see things through God's eyes. We are a prophetic people. 
When Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, couldn't remember the dream, he called all his magicians, astrologers, sorcerers, Chaldeans, for to shew the king his dream. So they came and stood before the king. And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syria, O king, live forever. Tell thy servants a dream, and we will tell thee, or shew thee the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The thing is gone from me. But if you will not make known unto me the dream, with the interpretation thereof, he shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunghill. But if he shew the dream, and the interpretation thereof, he shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream, and the interpretation thereof. Verse 7, Daniel 2, they answered again and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will shew the interpretation of it. The king answered and said, I know of a surety that he would gain the time, because he see the thing has gone from me. They couldn't do it. Then Daniel came. Are you with me? And explained the political realities to the king. There were political realities because he learned his kingdom was coming to an end. He didn't like it. That's why he put up an image of all gold in chapter 3. But there were political realities. And Daniel said, look, king, you know, I hate to tell you this, but you're going off the scene. Then the Persians will come, then they'll go off the scene. Then the Greeks will come, then they'll go off the scene. The Romans come, they'll go off the scene. And then the kingdom will come that will never go off the scene. Only a Seventh-day Adventist back then could explain the prophecies to Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> Somebody say amen. <laughs> Do you know what L.O.I. tells us? Jesus Christ was a Seventh-day Adventist. Medical ministry, page 49. Christ was a Seventh-day Adventist to all intents and purposes. Amen. He was an Adventist. That's what she writes. Not me, she. <laughs> Remember Pharaoh? Genesis 41? He had two dreams. Couldn't figure them out. He also called them magicians, astrologers, all the, these witch doctors. No one could explain. Then came another Seventh-day Adventist who was in prison for doing the, the right thing. What was his name? Joseph. And he explained, and Pharaoh raised him up. Daniel explained, and uh, Nebuchadnezzar raised him up. What am I saying? The only people qualified to explain what's going on in this world, whether climate change, political divisions, war, are God's prophetic people. Because this tells us, not CNN or MSNBC. Or the Petersburg Herald. <laughs> God's people. Here's what's happening. But in order to do that, we must be separate from the world. Our minds in heaven. Our feet on the ground. What did Jesus tell Pilate? My kingdom is not of this world. And there's no kingdom without citizens. You can't have a heavenly kingdom populated by earthly people. Then that's an earthly kingdom. A heavenly kingdom must be populated by heavenly citizens. That's why Jesus said, My disciples are not of this world. They are from above. How many of you will say with me, Father, please, by your grace, Constant infusion of your power. Help me to be a citizen from above. Can I see your hand? From above. Hands down. Help me to contribute to the church becoming one. Can I see your hand? Let me not be a troublemaker always causing division. Hands down. Jesus said in John 6 verse 70, Have I not chosen you twelve? One of you is a devil. The first... The early church, which was started by Christ, pastored by Christ, had a devil. In Matthew 13, Jesus told the disciples, let the wheat and the tares grow together. But in John 15, 1 to 3, Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husband man. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. The father takes people out of the church as he cleanses the church, 
perfects the church and gets it ready for the return of the bridegroom. He taketh away. When people leave the church sometimes, they say, well, the church drove me out. No. Heaven got rid of you. On some occasions, other occasions, they may have a just cause, but usually the Father is cleansing the church. You see, if you love God, no one can cause you to leave the church. You may go to another branch. You don't leave the church. Are you following me? You die, for, you don't leave the church. You may go to, you know, the church in wherever, Chesapeake, if the one in Petersburg is, you know, getting on your nerves every Sabbath, you go to one in Chesapeake. But you don't leave the Seventh-day Adventist church, God's remnant church, you don't do that. I mean, if you're six years old, that's another story. You can't be a 45-year-old man and say, the church drove me out. No, the church can't drive you out. You left. And could be you're one of those that God is getting rid of as he purifies his church. But God doesn't want to get rid of anyone. He wants to save everyone. But not even God can do that. I want a place in God's kingdom. I don't deserve it. I never will. But I want it. And I want it because he wants it for me. Are you following me? What did the king say to those on his right hand? Depart from me, curse in everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Not for you. I've said it many times. Any human being who goes to hell will be a gate crasher. Because hell was not prepared for people. It was prepared for the devil and his angels. And if a human being ends up there, the human being is no different from an angel of the devil. If you pass tonight, where are you going? We know the grave, but you know what I mean. If you or I pass tonight, where are we headed when Christ comes? Think. When we put our heads on those pillows tonight, let us make sure all is right between us and God and us and one another, which means if there's someone with whom you need to make things right, do that. Someone hurt you? Did you hurt God? Yes. Has God forgiven us? Yes. Call the person. I'll go. This has gone on long enough. God has convicted me. This is what you did to me. This is what I suffered. I lost my house, lost my car, lost my family. But I forgive you. In the name of Jesus. You hurt someone? This is what I did to you. I borrowed money, never paid back. I'm sorry I was wrong. I haven't gotten much, but I'll try one dollar per month. Pay you back. Restitution. Make it right. Are you with me? Yes. Make it right. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for calling us to be members of the family of heaven. Our citizenship, as the Bible tells us, Philippians 3 verse 20, is in heaven. Jesus told Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. Jesus prayed to the Father, the disciples are not of this world. And Jesus said, I pray for them. And for those who shall believe on them through their word, that includes us. Thank you, God, for loving us so much. And thank you for the deeper love that you shed on those who simply out of love obey you. Bless everyone under the sound of my voice. Draw them close to your bosom, dear God, so they feel your heart beating. Convict us to do what's right. Because we're headed for a world where everything will be done right. Let our lives be examples to others. Let many be ready to meet Christ when he comes because of us. As faithful witnesses, save us all when you come. Let our children enter the kingdom ahead of us, I pray. In Jesus' name, let God's people say, Amen and Amen. Family of God, do you love God? Amen. Do you look forward to seeing Him? Amen. I do. Before you come up, Mr. Question Man, 
when you get to the kingdom, whom do you want to see first? Just tell me. Someone on this side. Too slow, that side. Too slow. Oh, yes, okay. Who do you want to see first? Gee, all right, let's put Jesus in a class by himself where he belongs. Whom would you love to see first? Yes. Your mother. Ah, good son, good son. Yes. Who? Eve, Sister Eve. Did you say Eve? All right, Sister Eve. So you can ask her, what was she thinking? Okay, somebody on this side. Who do you want to see first? The Apostle Paul. Yes, my sister. Hannah, the mother of Samuel. Come back to the... Yes. Your mother and your brother. Your grandmother and your brother. Yes, my little brother. You want to see who first? Oh, God, yes, yes, yes. Solomon. Okay. Yes. Enoch. Who do you want to see first? What did she say? Who? She said she Oh, heaven. Oh, okay. All right. She wants to go sightseeing. Okay, that's fine. So, yes, my sister. Who? Your son. Your son. Moses. Good choice. Yes. Who? Oh, David, King David, the father of Jesus, yes. Anybody else? I want to see someone I'll be shocked to be Okay, <laughs> well then look in the mirror. Okay, and then, you'll <laughs> and then you'll see that person. <laughs> yes, look in the mirror, you'll see that person. <laughs> All right, okay, maybe your enemy, yes. Who? Your parents. You know who I want to see first after Jesus? Eliezer. The chief servant of Abraham, who went to get a wife for Isaac. Read about that man in Genesis 24. You'll come away impressed. Eliezer. I love that man a lot. I want to see him first after I see Jesus, of course, and my mother. I want to see Eliezer and chat with him. Eliezer knew that if Abraham had no son, he would inherit everything. Yet, Abraham chose him to go find a wife for Isaac. Eliezer could have sabotaged the mission. He didn't. He prayed. He prayed. God gave him a sign, and he got to Rebekah's house, let's say a Tuesday night. They sat down. They gave him food. He said, I will not eat until I've told my mission. The culture was food first, then business. It is still that way in many countries. Eliezer said, no food until I tell you why I'm here. They said, Okay. He told them he had some food. They said, can she stay 10 days and celebrate? Because he said, no. I have what I came for. I've got to go. Are you following me? <laughs> Next day, he was gone. I love that man. That man could have been a Navy SEAL for God. Are you with me? <laughs> On a mission. By the way, another reason why I like him, he represents the Holy Ghost. You see, Abraham is God the Father. Who is Jesus? Come on, don't hesitate. Isaac. Who is the church? The virgin church. Rebecca, who never knew a man. Jesus said, no man can come to me except the Father which have sent me draw him. Who is the drawing power? The Holy Ghost. Eliezer symbolizes the Holy Ghost. Isaac Christ. Rebecca, the pure church. Abraham, the Father God. And so I love Eliezer very much. I want to meet him. And of course, I want to meet you. And this is a reality. It's a reality. Let us not get caught up so much in surviving day to day. We forget the reality of the new life to come. All right, let's move to the question and answer session. Elder Rice, come and help us. Yes, yes. Well, now, I don't so. promise to answer all questions accurately. I'll try. Maybe some I can't answer at all. And I'll try to, try to ask the questions okay, properly. Elder. But uh, first right. of all, before we start the questions and answers, thank you for coming right. and visiting us this past week. It's been a blessing. God bless you all. I really mean that. Before you ask Amen. the question, let me uh, thank brother and sister Farmer. Amen. For your great Amen. kindness. I really mean that sincerely. I... Uh, I'm staying in your home, 
And I, uh, I was telling God today, I leave this place without one microscopic complaint. You know, sometimes you give a lady a bouquet of flowers. I leave with a bouquet of pleasant memories. I really do. All fragrant. Thank you. God bless you. God bless your children. God bless your business. I want God to do for you what he did for Job that caused the devil to complain. Here's what the devil said. Hast thou not made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? I want God to bless that family on every side. Those of you who gave me food, may God bless you on every side and save your children before he saves you. Thank you so much for making this an experience I will not forget. Thank you. God bless you. Amen. And I say that in the presence of a holy God. Thank you. Questions? Right. Thank you. So we'll continue to strike while the iron's hot. Mm -hmm. First question. How did the sin originate in the heaven in the presence of a holy God? All right. Father in heaven, as we try to answer questions, grant me wisdom according to your promise in James 1, 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Father, you know I lack it. Give it to me that you may be glorified in the responses and your people enlightened in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The Bible has two mysteries, the mystery of iniquity and the mystery of godliness. It does not explain how sin began. It simply tells us iniquity was found in Satan. There is no other explanation. So I don't know. I don't know. We know where it, in whom it began. We can understand how the closest person to God. You know what L.O.I. says of Lucifer? Our, the faith I live by, page 7, uh, six, six, 6, paragraph 2. God made him good and beautiful as near as possible, like himself. And sin began in him. It's a mystery. When we get to the other side, the Father will explain. Mm -hmm. All right. Next question. When the Bible says, confess your sins, mm -hmm. does that mean we confess them to others when we have done something to them, mm -hmm. such as lie, or do we just confess our sins to God? You confess to both. If you've hurt someone, you confess to the person, I'm sorry. Now we're supposed to go to God whom we hurt and tell God, I'm sorry. And so we go to people and we tell them, I'm sorry I did this, I did that. Uh, yes, that's the general practice. Yes, tell the person and then receive the person's forgiveness. Even if the person does not forgive you, still say, I'm sorry. Because you cannot be responsible for the person's response just for yours. You say, I am sorry for what I did and say it sincerely, leave it at that. Next question. Please expand on 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 11. Why does it appear as God sending a delusion? Okay, let's, let's read from verse 9 of 2 Thessalonians 2. That chapter deals with the Antichrist. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, reading from verse 9. Why does God send a delusion to cause people to believe error? Is that exactly what the verse means? Let's get beneath the surface. Do you have 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 9? Speaking of the Antichrist, the verse says what? Whose? Coming is after the power of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be they rejected truth consciously this isn't ignorance this is willful rejection of truth don't tell me the seventh day of the sabbath you ruin my business they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved this is conscious rejection and for this cause verse 11 god shall send them that they should believe Verse 12, that they all might be damned who? But had pleasure in? Here are people who love to do wrong. Who consciously reject the truth. God doesn't have to send a delusion. Here's what God does. Go to Romans 1. Let's look at the same people described differently. Romans 1. Let's read from verse uh, 16. Let's read several verses. 
Romans 1, reading from verse 16. When you found it, say amen. amen. Read with me. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the what? Righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Verse 18, for the wrath of God is what? Revealed from heaven against what? All ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. To hold means suppress. They suppress the truth. In a, now this is conscious, conscious behavior. Verse 19, what does that say? Because that which may be known of God is manifest, come on, in them. Why? For God hath showed it unto them. They have seen and rejected. Are you following me? How did they see? Ah, verse 20 tells us, what does that say? For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, finish the verse, so that they are without excuse. Nature tells us there's a God. Now, nature may not tell us the seven days of Sabbath, but nature tells us there's a power. And if that's all you know, that's all God requires. Now, God is such a nice person. Hmm? They're without excuse. Now, let's go to verse 24. Wherefore, God what? Hath also give ye God also gave them up to what? Uncleanness and the lust of their heart. What does it mean by God gave them up? We've read where they deliberately ignored God, ignored God. So God said, okay. You left them to what? He, mm -hmm. he gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their own heart. Look at verse 26. Come on, read with me for this reason God gave them up to what? Vile affection, talking about women going after women. They determined to do it. Okay. Go to verse 28. And, as, and what? Even as they did not retain God in their what? He did what? Gave them over to a reprobate mind. So we see verse 24, God gave them up. Verse 26, God gave them up. Verse 28, God, because that's what they determined to do. Now when God does that, you become gripped by error as a form of severe demon possession. You see truth in your spit. So 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 11. God sends him a delusion. Ellen White explains in Acts of the Apostles, page 266, paragraph 2, he just withdraws his spirit. And then error grips them like a possessing spirit. It is dangerous to hear the truth and reject it. But God doesn't send lies. There are no lies in heaven. There are no lies in God. God is all truth. Satan is lies. But God allows because he forces no one. When Jesus healed the demoniac of the Gadarenes, what did the people tell him? Leave the country. They lost their business. The demons went into the pigs. The pigs drowned, 2,000 of them. The people said, leave. You're hurting our business. What did Jesus do? He left. <laughs> he left the whole world, but he forces no one. He left. And so God just withdraws his spirit. And the delusion comes. And it's written as if he sends it. No, he withdraws his spirit. The natural result, error comes in and possesses people beyond their control. By the way, this is just my saying. One of the worst forms of demon possession is error. Mm -hmm. People are so gripped in error. When they hear the truth, they get angry. So gripped in error, possessed by the spirit of error, the truth makes them angry. Next question. Why did Jesus not just go behind the fallen angels to take them back to heaven? Why only man? Why did not Jesus go behind the fallen angels to uh, take them back? Yeah, I think since All right. the fallen angels... Yeah, let's look at Jesus. Go to Hebrews 13 verse 8. Hebrews 13, verse 8. Yeah. 
You have Hebrews 13 verse 8. You know it very well. What does that say? Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Which means the Christ we saw on the earth, the character he developed, is no different from what he was before he came. Same character. But he developed it in human form, meeting temptation. He developed a righteous character. Now, he's the same yesterday, today, forever. Malachi 3 verse 6, I am the Lord, I change not. James 1 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of light with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. God doesn't change. Now, which means, now, go to John 13. John 13. The question is, why didn't Jesus go after the fallen angels to save them the way he came after us? Do you have John 13? Someone read for me verse 18. Uh-huh. Whom I have chosen. Uh-huh. The scripture might be. Go on. Yes. Ah. Wait a minute now. Who is listening to Jesus? This is the last supper. Come on. Who is listening to Jesus? The 12 disciples, including whom? Judas. Now, Jesus says, he that hath eaten bread with me lifted up his heel against me. This is the prophecy, uh, Psalm 41, verse 9. Judas is sitting there and he is listening. What do you think Christ is doing? Trying to reach him. Conf yes. Read verse 21. Same person, verse 21. Mm -hmm. Spirit and said, uh huh, uh huh. Wait a minute. That's clue number two. Who is he trying to reach? Judah. Go to verse 26. Mm -hmm. Because John asked Judas, Peter told John, asked Judas, who is it? Judas said, he to whom I'll give the salt. When I've dipped it, keep reading. And when? Uh-huh, he gave it to? Stop. How many times have we seen Jesus trying to reach Judas? At least three times. That's recorded. Mm -hmm. He's trying to reach him. Now, go to John 6, 70. John 6, verse 70. I hope my friends are still with us online. Wherever you are, God bless you. It may be 2 o'clock in the morning where you are, I don't know, but wherever you are, God bless you. Thank you for staying with us. Right here in uh, Virginia, it's uh, 25 after 5. Do you have John 6, 70? Ian, read for us. What does that say? John 6, verse 70. 7, 0. Yeah, my fault, my fault entirely. Mm, anyone can read it. Very familiar verse. Jesus answered and said what? Have I not chosen you, 12? Now, Jesus said that in chapter 6. Are you with me? One of you is the devil. Now, in chapter 13 of the Last Supper, who is he dealing with? A devil. Are you not with me? He is dealing with the devil. What's he trying to do? Reach a devil. Are you following me? Now, Jesus is the same. Come on. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. How do you think he dealt with the original devils? Same way. He tried. He tried. He tried. They said, no, no, no. God is all-powerful, but he cannot force. Jesus tried, Elder Rice. They rejected. Mm -hmm. They rejected. Next question. Um, I think I'm going to combine these next all right. four. Okay. Okay, okay. Because they all have to do with women's ordination or women. Okay. 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 Um, is there a back is, door here I can get up? Yeah, I, mean, <laughs> I think you knew it was coming. Okay. So, okay. is woman's ordination yes. biblical? Mm -hmm. And what does the Bible say about women wearing men's clothing and uh -huh. men wearing women's clothing? Mm -hmm. Can you also speak specifically about women wearing pants? Women what? Pants. Okay. What does the Bible say about a woman messenger if she's been called? 
And can you show us from the Bible if a woman can be pastors or elders? Okay. Now, the, the Seventh day Adventist Church has confronted this issue for decades. And as an organization, the church has not yet seen biblically the justification for ordaining women to the position of pastor. They have not yet seen it. The church has not seen it. Consequently, the church has voted against it. I can only give you the church's position. Okay. I personally have not yet seen it where ordination of a woman is biblically supported. I have not seen it. Notice my words. I don't claim to see everything. I have not seen it. All right. A woman speaking in church, I don't know if that was part of it, but I'll say it. The Bible does not condemn women speaking for him. Otherwise, God would not have sent Ellen White to speak for us. This text about women keep silent, that needs to be studied carefully. There were women in the Bible who spoke, who ministered with Paul. Two of them in Philippians chapter 4, verse 2 and 3, Yodius and Syntyche, there's Priscilla and Aquila. Priscilla took Apollos aside and taught him the Bible more properly. He could speak, but he didn't know the truth. So there were women who served. Deborah was a judge. She clearly spoke for God. So whatever women keep silent in church means, it does not mean a woman cannot stand in a pulpit. All right. The church has no problem with that at all. Women wearing pants... <laughs> Okay. Now, the Bible does not tell us what belongs to man, what belongs to woman. Are you with me? It simply says, a woman shouldn't wear what belongs to man, a man shouldn't wear what belongs to a woman. Now, what belongs to man and a woman varies from culture to culture. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. The Bible doesn't say, this is a man's clothing. It says, this, the Bible is uh, coming out of the, the, uh, the, the tradition of the, those who wrote it. The Middle East tradition. Of course, the principles are worldwide. Don't misunderstand me. Let's take the pants. Can you tell a woman's pants from a man's pants by looking at it? Yes. yes. Let's leave the pants alone for a while. Do women wear shirts? Are they men's clothing? They call them blouses. Do they have sleeves? Can you button them? Do they have a collar? They're worn by women. They look like shirts. What do you do? This fellowship of women for wearing a, a, a blouse? Are you following me? What is it that truly pertains to women? A society decides that. A culture decides that. Because what's fit for women in India may not be fit for women in, Mich in uh, Richmond or Michigan. I've been to India. And Indian ladies dress very attractively, but sometimes the whole midsection is exposed. You walk into my church like that, and you're not from India. <laughs> You've got a problem. Are you with me? You've got a problem. I've been to Ghana several times. Sometimes they men on the pulpit. They have what looks like uh, something wrapped around them, and uh, sandals, no socks, and that's proper dress. You pop up that way in my church, people ask you, what's wrong with you? And so, when you talk about, the, the basic principle is, if it belongs to a woman, let the woman wear it. If it belongs to a man, let the man. But the Bible does not identify specific pieces of clothing and say, this is for man, this is for woman, this is for man, this is for woman. Even in the days of Jesus, you would have to look closely to know who's a man and who's a woman. They all wore those long flowing things. Now, they knew how to differentiate. You put me in that culture, I couldn't tell who's who. The principle is, when you dress, look like you're, of course, in this time in which we live, you, is it the word gender to use or sex? I just don't know. And I'm not being disrespectful, I don't know. Because the world is all confused about, are you male or female? So don't put, in my state, just pass a law, if you call someone she or he, you can go to prison. The fundamental principle is, do you look like a woman if you're a woman? So you don't confuse people. You see, gender differences are fundamental to God. When God made Adam and Eve, we don't know the color of their hair, their height, color of their skin, their eyes, nothing. The only physical information we have, one was male, one was female. That's all we have. This must have been important to God, male, female. Amen. Not uh, mm -mm, male, female. And the church has to take that stand, regardless of ridicule from society. Man, woman. 
What pertains to man, let the man wear. Now, if I came to church with my wife's dress, now we have a problem. Are you following me? My wife's high heels, you have to call my psychiatrist. There is a problem. Clearly, I'm cross-dressing. Are you with me? But I can tell every woman in this building, and I can tell every man, there isn't a woman that looks like a man or a man that looks like a woman. Father, you speak to him. Do I dress to glorify you? Do I look like your child? Am I honoring the principle of not dressing like the opposite sex? Am I honoring it by the way I dress? The cultures vary in what's for man. Do you know many years ago men wore high heels? Somehow the switch occurred. Many, many years ago, high heels were worn by men. I mean, hundreds of years ago, men. How the change came, I don't know. So those 400 years ago who were preaching, men should look like women. Women who wore high heels were looking like men. But it changed over the centuries. Now a man in high heels is uh, looked at very strangely. All right. Well, this question in gets the 70s, into trouble there all were the time. elevator shoes for Say all again? those guys. In the 70s, there were elevator shoes for oh, all the yes. guys. Yes, I had a pair. Don't yeah. tell anyone. But I had a pair. <laughs> Oh, God forgive me for being so stupid. I had a pair yeah. of elevator shoes. Ah, yeah. oh, I look so well-dressed and stupid. Yeah. All right. Well, going, <laughs> next question. Going into the next question, uh -huh. you know, kind of reminds me, I'm going to kind of go. Okay. Going back in time again, the 1980s, when there was this question once, this, somebody said it, it, it was like, who's better, Joe Montana mm -hmm. or Magic Johnson? Okay. All right. So here we have a question. Mm-hmm. Who is greater, Moses or Paul? Okay. <laughs> Jesus said the greatest among men was John the Baptist. That's what he said. I don't know who's greater, Paul or Moses. I know Moses is in heaven. I know the Bible says no man ever spoke face to face like with God the way Moses did. But I also know that the great Elamite said the greatest teacher after Jesus was Paul. But I don't know who's greater. I wouldn't know how to determine that. I thank God for both of them. Yes? Yes, 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 yes. Well, that seems to give the edge to Moses, yes. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, that's true. No one like Moses, before or after. Mm -hmm. I can't think of it now. Yeah, that's true. Very good, very good. Well, God bless you. Mm -hmm. All right, so next. Moses has the edge over Paul based on that, but neither one of them really cared. Mm -hmm. Next question. Uh huh. If one confessed sins yes. he committed before, uh huh, but goes back repeating similar things, is the confession genuine? Mm -hmm. Now, after he finally gets it together, uh huh. Though the power of Christ indwelling the whole with the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. surrenders his life to Christ, is he not supposed to go and confess all those sins that he did confess initially, but, con but confirm to, to do them before he finally gave his life over to Christ mm -hmm. in case they were not forgiven? Okay. okay. That, yeah. Let me answer as I think I understand the question. If someone comes to God and confesses, I'm wrong, forgive me, that person is forgiven. Now, if you leave God and go back to following Satan, your sins come back on you. I tell you why. Forgiven sins are not the same as blotted out sins. A forgiven sin exists as a record in heaven. A blotted out sin ceases to exist. Now, what Christ is doing now is blotting out sins of his people so they can never come back upon them. Are you following me? He is blotting out sins. But sins are forgiven, there's a record of that sin. When it's blotted out, it ceases to exist. It is possible, yes, to confess genuinely and then have a relapse. And all the sins you confess, they come back on you. Because if you never came back and you're lost, you're lost for all the sins you've committed. The other side is true, according to Ezekiel, 3, Ezekiel chapter 3. If a righteous man doth turn at his righteousness and commit iniquity, his righteousness shall not be remembered. Both sides the same way. So yes, but if ultimately you finally get it right and you come to God, you stay with him, all of that is no longer on you. Mm -hmm. Next question. 
If I knew that someone was rejecting Jesus in a certain area of their lives, mm -hmm. how would I approach them to help them? Good question. We are to help one another. Galatians 6 verse 3, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. I think Galatians 6 2. And Galatians 6 5, every man shall bear his own burden. So we have two texts. Yes, there's a degree to which you tell a person, listen, my brother, my sister, you know, you, know, you, you shouldn't be robbing banks, whatever it is. Yes, you do that. Now, don't go to the point where you become a spiritual policeman. Then people see you, they start avoiding you. All you ever do is tell people they're wrong. No, don't do that. But the church has a responsibility to help each other. And if you know, the church knows I'm working on Sabbath, you know, at a gas station or something, Someone should come to me and say, listen, maybe the pastor, the head elder, somebody, my brother, how can we help you to honor God? We know you love him. How can we help you? Not you up for being, you're up, you're up at the next church board to be this fellowship. How can we help you? The Bible tells us how to do that. Galatians 6 verse 1, brethren, if any man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. You see, what happened to him can happen to me. And so we try in the spirit of meekness. If you're in a church with someone you've never spoken to the person, never said hello, never invited the person to your house for lunch, then the first time you speak to them is to tell them how sinful they are. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Let somebody else do that. Are you with me? The pastor, the leaders, or someone in the church who has a relationship to whom the person is willing to listen. But yes, we must look out for each other's spiritual welfare. Because L.I. tells us clearly, if we see sin and say nothing, we become responsible. But we're not to make it a career to look for sins because she also says those who look for sins become like the sins they look for so sin hunters look like the sins they hunt so it's a delicate delicate balance point out sin without hunting sin because it's always delicate when a sinner is pointing out sin but it must be done yes must be done next question says in one of your sermons, you mentioned that Christ has no longer omnipresence. He has laid it aside. Can mm -hmm. you explain or talk more about that? Yes. I always, she says, or he says, um, I always thought that after he went back to heaven, he continued to be omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient. Christ is still God. Now, I never said Christ lost omnipresence. I said he laid it aside. That's a different thing. He doesn't use it is part of the cost of our salvation. That's why Christ cannot be everywhere at the same time. He still has human form. We need to understand the tremendous expense involved in our salvation. It required a change in the makeup of the Godhead. Christ no longer can go anywhere at the same time because he has voluntarily covered himself in human form, and will remain that way how long? Forever. It's not that he lost it. He doesn't use it. Mm -hmm. Omnipotence. He's still omnipotent, omniscient. He still has omnipresence. He doesn't use it. Because he voluntarily clothed himself in the limitations of human form. That's why he dwells in us by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit can be everywhere at the same time. I can't explain that. Mm -hmm. It really costs a lot to save us. It really costs a lot. How many of you would change your family just for the sake of a hobo who comes to your house one night for a plate of food? How many of you would change? Next question. Is it a sin to go over the speed limit? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Yes, with a capital Y, and stop doing it. Mm -hmm. Stop speeding. Are you with me? I used to speed. We call it flying low. I used to do that. And the Lord delivered me from it. Uh, that's before you were born. He delivered me from it. And I thank him for that. You know, I have no desire to speed. In my state, the limit is 70. They let you do 75, no problem. But if I see myself at 75, I'm shocked. Come back down. Sometimes you just lose consciousness. I don't like to speak. God took it out of me completely. 
Really, I've told the story before. I'll tell you again quickly. I used to drive a little car, Honda CRX. That's, you weren't born when those came out. And so I had one of those, a little two-seat, and I bought it because I just wanted to take me and my wife, nobody else. My wife and me, nobody else. It was a selfish reason for buying that car. Can't give you a lift. There are only two seats. <laughs> uh, pray for me. Okay. Anyway, one day I was sitting in the car in my parking lot, and I said, Father, this car is yours. I dedicated it to him. I'll drive it, change the tire, the oil, whatever. It's yours. Two weeks later, I got into the car to go somewhere, and I was ready to fly low. The Spirit literally said to me, and I mean literally, I heard him, this is my car now. You cannot drive it like that. Mm. Brothers and sisters, in the presence of a holy God, from that point till now, about 20-something years ago, I lost all desire for speeding. God just took it out. Peter says in 1 Peter 4.15, let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, a busybody in other men's matters, or a break of the speed limit. That's what he said. <laughs> you see, we bring suffering on ourselves by violating the law of the land. Then we say, Lord, what are you doing? What do you mean, what am I doing, says God? You must obey the laws of the land unless they conflict with the law of God. So yes, don't speed. How many of you will keep the speed limit when you leave today? May I see your hand? Okay. <laughs> well, the Lord still loves you. <laughs> okay. Yes, next question. Excellent. Next question. Uh -huh. What does the Bible say about gambling? Gambling? Well, there's no direct text that says thou shalt not gamble, but the Bible has several texts that said, labor not to be rich. Avoid the pursuit of riches. Uh, 1 Timothy 6, 9 to 11. The Bible condemns any scheme to get rich quickly. It does. And that's the purpose of gambling. Generally speaking, I give you $6, I get $6 million. I bet on, you know, the Los Angeles Lakers, I pay $5, I get $5,000. I bet on a horse or a donkey or a cow, I pay $2, I get $10,000. That's, that's the reason for that. Are you with me? And the Bible is against those get rich you know, they cause problems even in the church. Some member comes up and says, well, I have a scheme here. Not a scheme, but I have a money making. If you give me $10, I'll give you. And then churches run into problems. Yes. Run into pro it happens sometimes. Mm. People want to get rich fast. The Bible is against it. So that's the most I can say. There's a general principle. Avoid this mad rush for wealth. The Bible is not against wealth. I need to say that. Abraham was very wealthy. Isaac Jacob, Solomon, Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus, wealthy men. I wish more Christians were wealthy. A lot of suffering would be eased. Are you following me? But pursuing wealth as your number one priority is contrary to the Bible. Mm -hmm. Next question. So would that include Powerball and lottery tickets? Yes, yes, Powerball, lottery ticket, uh, scratch-offs if you're from the hood. You know, all, all that stuff. <laughs> I, All that <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> huh? You know, my father, he used to live in England, and there was some gambling thing. It's called spot the ball or something. There was, there was a soccer ball on, looked like a crossword. You had to guess where the ball would be, and you put down some pounds. Get, did all of that. He told me once that gambling was so common in England, if a fly landed on the wall, people start betting, you know, when, when the fly will fly off. Mm. That's what he told me. He used to live in England. Two flies landed, started betting. Which one will fly away first? That's not for the Christian. Mm -hmm. All right. <clears throat> Say that again. No, 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 no. I'm, I, don't know, I don't comment on stocks. No, 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 um, no. I'm not putting stocks in the same bracket. No, 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 no. But we must also be very careful. Mm-hmm. Next because question. God's money. Mm -hmm. Is it okay to cook on the Sabbath? Cooking cook on in Sabbath? a slow cooker. Is it a <laughs> sin to eat food cooked on a Sabbath? <laughs> a slow cooker? That's the way it will I'm feel in hell for a lot of people. Yeah. Slow cooking. Uh, <laughs> Exodus 6 is very clear. Cook that which you'll cook on the Friday. See that which you'll see. Ellen White tells us we're not to cook on the Sabbath. She said, you can warm the food. There's no need to eat cold food, but there's to be no cooking on Sabbath. Simple as that. 
Whether you have a slow cooker or a fast cooker, there, you see, sin has given us a tremendous ability to work our way around the law. You see? <laughs> we just, we like worms, we just slither, we get around the law. Don't cook. Are you with me? Amen. Cook on Friday. If you have no refrigerator, believe God to keep it fresh. I'm not joking. Did we not say Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever? You have no refrigerator? Make the food. It'll be fresh on Sabbath. That's what he did for the Israelites. Mm -hmm. I mean, do your best. Cook the freshest kind of food you can. And leave the rest to God. Honoring God always brings blessings. No cooking on Sabbath. Okay, I'm going to see if we could possibly connect these three questions All right, together. Okay. I think they're related. Mm -hmm. And it says, um, how do you connect the three days and three nights that Jesus was in, in the tomb? Mm -hmm. And we've heard from some folks that Jesus died in the middle of the week, so mm -hmm. did Jesus die on a Wednesday? Mm -hmm. What does the Bible say about that when Jesus died? And then it says... Do we have to keep the feasts of the Bible, which I think this is where the this feast is of the Bible, the feasts of the Bible, or the feasts? Yep. The, no, we don't have to keep the feasts. And in, a, in the Hebrew mind, three days and three nights is satisfied by the third day. The Bible says he rose after three days. The Bible says he rose the third day. We have both expressions. For the Hebrew mind, three days, three nights could also mean any part of a day was considered the day. Are you with me? He rose early Sunday morning, so he was in the grave on Sunday. He rose early that morning. He was in the grave on Sabbath. He was in the grave part of Friday. Part of Friday, part of Sunday, all of Sabbath. But since he was in the part of each, it's considered three days, three nights. It's an expression which the Hebrews understood to mean any part of a day is considered the day. Uh, let's say you went to the supermarket yesterday. You were there from one to two. When did you go to the supermarket? Yesterday. Mm -hmm. Were you in the supermarket on Monday? Yes, I was there Monday. Not necessarily Monday 1 to 2. I was in the supermarket on Monday. The biblical understanding is part of a day represents the day Christ was buried on a, uh, crucified on a Friday, Riz rose on a Sunday, part of each day, three days, three nights. Mm -hmm. All right, somebody else. Next question. How how shall we pray for our lost sons and daughters? Isaiah 49, 25. Let's go to that verse. Very serious question. How shall we pray for our lost sons and daughters? Isaiah 49, 25. We must ask God to do what he says he will do. Trust him to do it. Isaiah 49, Verse 25, and may the Lord continue to give me wisdom as we come to the end of this question session. We have Isaiah 49. Somebody read it for us. Verse 25. Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. Even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away. Even the captive of the mighty shall be, in other words, a lion has a gazelle. Are you with me in his jaws? Someone takes away the gazelle. The captive of the mighty, the predator and the prey. Keep reading. The prayer, so we see the prayer of the terrible, be delivered. Now keep reading. I will contend with them, come on, that contend with thee, finish it nice and clear. I will save thy children. Now, ask God to do what he said. Sometimes we try to save people. Only God can save. The Bible tells us God is not willing that any should perish. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Bible tells us God, is, God will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. Ask God to do that and pray. If there's one prayer God will hear, it's the prayer of a mother for a child. You know why? Jesus had a mother who carried him. Pray for your children. The Bible says, if we ask anything according to his will, come on, he heareth us. Is saving someone God's will, yes or no? Yes. When you pray, remind God of what he said. Did you not say, I will save thy children? My child is off in the world. Please, God, save my child. God may do it in a way you don't like. 
You may get a call, the child is in the hospital. And on that bed, the child accepts Christ. You may not like it. But the ultimate desire is, save my child. God loves to save. It's his speciality. He loves to save. Remind him that he said that. And ask him to do it. And pray and pray and pray. He wants to save us more than we want to be saved. Mm -hmm. He wants to save your child more than you want to see your child saved. You cannot outlove God. Mm -hmm. All right, next question. How do you keep the Sabbath day How? holy? Let's go to Isaiah 40, uh, 58. Read 13 and 14. All good Adventists know that passage very well. Isaiah 58, 13 and 14. Do you have it? It's five minutes to six. Isaiah 58, 13 and 14. When you found it, say amen. Read with me. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath. What does that mean? Okay, but what does that mean? If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath. Okay, don't trample on it. What does your foot on something suggest in the Bible? Go to Acts chapter 7. Let's read verse 4. This is Stephen preaching, and he begins with the history of Abraham being called by God out of Chaldeans. Okay, Acts 7, read verse 4. Listen to Stephen now. We're trying to answer the question, what does it mean to have your foot on something? Someone read for us. Mm -hmm. Acts chapter 7, verse 4. Uh huh. Yes. He removed. Mm hmm. Now, read verse 5 carefully. Pause. And he gave him no inheritance. Go on. No, not even. Ah. Not even to set his foot on to say, This is mine. Are you with me? It's a symbolic expression of ownership. When Lucifer went up to heaven, or Satan, and God said, Whence comest thou? What did he say? From there, yeah, walking up and down in there, mm -hmm, is mine. In Genesis 13, when God, uh, Lot, and, and Abraham separated, God told Abraham, Arise, walk through the land. In the length of it, act as though it's yours. The Sabbath is not ours. The Sabbath belongs to whom? So God said, remove your foot from the Sabbath. Not only trampling it disrespectfully, but acting as if this is my day, I can do whatever I like. If thou remove thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, it's not what you want, it's what God recommends. And call the Sabbath a delight. The holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, keep it in the knot, Doing thine own ways, nor, come on, nor speaking thine own words. Stop. Oh, oh hold on. Oh, okay, hold on. <laughs> hold on. Not doing thine own ways is not what you want. It's what's fit for the Sabbath. Not finding thine own pleasures. Someone told me there was an elder of a church. He'd go fishing on Sabbath afternoon and call it being out in nature. <laughs> The human beings are funny people. You, know? <laughs> you go fishing, I'm out in nature. Or some other person goes skiing, I'm out in nature. We think God is senile. You know, he isn't senile. God's looking at this, not your skis. He's looking at this. Not the fish, this. The Sabbath is a holy day. Hello, I says the law is as sacred as God himself. Amen. Not speaking thine own words. Don't discuss the playoffs on Sabbath. Perhaps not any day. <laughs> That's not your business. Don't discuss business on Sabbath. Ellen White said, don't even think about it. Because if you do, you've broken the Sabbath. Forget that and focus on holy things. Go in the community, help somebody. Go to the hospital, nursing home, pray for the sick, sing for the shut-in, do something. It's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And see what Ellen White has to say. 
about Sabbath keeping. But it's different from the rest of the six days. And so we keep the Sabbath by determining what is holy, what is fit. When the women came to anoint the body of Jesus, the Sabbath was coming on. They decided not to do it. They went home, kept the Sabbath, then came back. Now, that's serious. What was so wrong about anointing the body of Jesus on Sabbath? It was not fit for the Sabbath. Are you with me? The body of Jesus, they couldn't do it. The Bible says they went and kept the Sabbath according to the commandment. The commandment condemned that kind of thing. They didn't do it. You may call that extreme. I call that obedience. Amen. And so you ask God, Father, how should I honor your day? Study the Bible, read Eloise's writings. You'll be surprised the instruction you will receive. The Sabbath is a different day. When I was a small boy, about 15 minutes before sunset on Friday, we'd cover turn down magazines. You couldn't see the cover, literally. And uh, you cover a television set with a, a little uh, towel or something. That evil eye, you cover it. And you put away things that would distract you. We covered everything. Then we had a little song service, a prayer. When the Sabbath came, that's where we were. Towards sunset, we met again, 15 minutes before at church or at home, prayed. So the day left us in prayer. Then we uncovered what was covered up. Uh, and so that's, uh, that was back then, long time ago, the old ways. And we sang the hymns. You could always tell an Adventist family on Friday evening, you walk through the village, they're singing. You know the Adventists by the songs they sang. You never confuse them with somebody else. You knew who they were by the songs they sang. Amen. I heard someone say there's something called musical ecumenism, and that's very, very true. But I won't go into that. All right, next question. I think I'd like to, to combine the last two okay. questions together <laughs> okay. because I think they're related here uh -huh. and uh, probably appropriate okay. to close. What is the best way to begin studying the Bible? All right. Should we read it Genesis to Revelation or mm -hmm. by topic or mm -hmm. use study guides or mm -hmm. you know, how do we start? And then... How can we keep our spiritual fires lit after your departure? Oh. <laughs> Bible study, the major focus of Bible study is to discover God's will for your life from day to day. That's the major purpose for Bible study. And of course, to grow in your knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There are several ways to study the Bible. You may take a theme or a word and study it. For instance, you may take righteousness you go to where it first pops up, either just or righteous. They mean the same thing in the Hebrew. And you trace that word through the Bible. You may decide to study a person. Otherwise, said one of the most effective ways to study the Bible is to study the biographies of Bible characters. Daniel, Joseph, David, whomever. You study their lives until you know everything about them and you get the spiritual lessons. Another way to study is to take a little book and say, let me master this book. What is the message of this book? Why was it written? By whom? To whom? You know, for what reason? What's the application today? You can take Titus, three chapters, or 1 John, five chapters, or 3 John, one chapter, 2 John, one chapter, Philemon, one chapter. You master it. What does it say? Why? When was it written? To whom? How does it apply today? Now, you can decide to take this. I uh, heard this friend of mine, he gave this simple method of Bible study, and I always recommend it to people. You take a Bible verse. Let's say Philippians 4, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. They have no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. You take that and you ask some questions. Here are the questions my friend recommends. One, what is the verse saying? You literally ask the question, you write it down. What's the verse saying? Two, what's the verse saying to me? The Bible must be personalized. What's it saying to me? Three, is this verse pointing out a sin I need to give up? Four, is the verse revealing a duty I need to perform? 
5. How does this verse help me understand another part of the Bible? For instance, Genesis, uh, John 1.1, 1, 1, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Then you go to 14, the Word became flesh. Now 14 explains 1. Ah, the person in verse 1 was Jesus. You understand? One verse. Another question you could ask, how does this verse help me to understand the character of God? Is there something in it that teaches me the character of God? You can ask the question, how can I use this verse to encourage someone else? And from my standpoint, would I like to memorize this verse? Are you with me? Simple, effective way to study. Other people reduce it to three questions. What? Who? Why? What is being said? Why? To whom? You choose the one you want. The most important thing is a desire. Not just to study, but to obey what you learn. John 7 verse 17 tells us, If any man will do his will, he shall know the doctrine. One condition for understanding God's word is a willingness to obey. And sometimes just read the Bible, read a passage, just meditate on it. Eastern meditation tells you empty your mind. Biblical meditation tells you fill your mind. Are you with me? Never empty your mind because the enemy will come rushing in. Fill your mind and dwell on that. Are you following me? In one of my favorite Psalms is Psalm 3. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which save my soul. There is no help for him in God. And sometimes we feel as if the whole world is against us. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of my head. Depressed people never walk around like this. They walk like that. The Bible says, God, lift up your head. Look up. There's no help this way. Look up. I love that. You take it to yourself. My whole family is against me because I decided to become an Adventist. I feel like a stranger. Father, I feel down. And Christ was depressed in Gethsemane. John the Baptist was depressed in prison. Lift up my head. He'll do that. You personalize it. Lift up my head. My entire church has gone Pentecostal, evangelical. I feel all alone. I don't recognize the music anymore, the style of worship. Where am I, Father? Be with me. Don't let me get swept away. Personalize it. And take time for prophecy. Get Daniel Revelation. Ella White recommends it highly. It's not a perfect book, but she recommends it highly. And try to study for yourself. Take the seven churches. What are the messages for us today? Particularly, Laodicea. See what you learn. The Spirit of God will open your eyes and surprise you. One of the greatest blessings you can experience is to have the Spirit reveal something to you. A flash of light. When that happens, you can't sit still. Personal experience, you cannot sit still. All right. That's my response to the Bible. Yes, my good brother. Can't, I can't. Uh huh. Then the end shall come, yes. There are some things that have to happen before Christ comes. He said so himself. The gospel has to be preached before he comes. Because when he comes, there's no more probation. He has to be sure everyone has heard the gospel, then he comes. He also wants to make sure he's coming to people ready for him. So when the character of Christ is perfectly reproduced, then he'll come. So certain things have to be there before he comes. He may have to do something to hasten that. Because he can't stay away forever. But some things have to happen before Christ comes. Yes. Yes. All right, my good brother. Yes. I. Yes. What's the question? What's the question? Yes. When they were cast out, yes. Yeah, absolutely closed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
When God shut the door to the ark, those on the outside, probation closed. They couldn't get in, and those inside couldn't get out. The close of probation seals the saved in salvation and seals the lost in perdition. Mm -hmm. And the thing about probation is very frightening, but I shouldn't say frightening, but it is. You don't know. L.Y. says, every day, the probation of some is closing. Every day, some are passing beyond the reach of mercy. You don't know. All you know is the Spirit is still working on my heart. We surrender to God every day. Because we may pass away today. Mm -hmm. But of course, there will also be a close of probation, which is global for the whole world. It's finished. Then the plagues come. The plagues come when probation is closed for the whole world. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other question, Elder Rice? Okay. So I think we're... God bless you. As I said before, I mean it. God bless your children. You are a member of the family of God. Live that way. People said of Jesus, what manner of man is this? That's what they must say of Adventists. What kind of people are these? They get along. They don't fight. What kind of people are these? And then people will come. The most evangelistic form of advertising is faithfulness to God. And then people come. Many years ago, I was part of campus ministries for the Michigan Conference, and the young people had a, a booth somewhere downtown. And we had a lot of samples of vegetarian meats and foods. And so people came by and we gave them literature. And this man came by, he was a white man, older man. He came, he said, I don't want any food. I don't want any literature. Explain to me how young people of different ethnicities could work so smoothly together. That was his question. Because we had Asian, white, black, Hispanic young people. They're working together. So his question was, I do not want food. I want no literature. Someone explained to me, how is it you young people work together of different ethnic groups and the society can't do it? That was his question. It, have an, it had an evangelistic effect. And so may God do. Don't, I don't want to talk to you long, but don't be the reason why someone is discouraged on Sabbath morning. Don't be the reason why someone wants to join another church. Be a ray of sunlight. Encourage someone. We come to church on Sabbath morning, we have burdens no one can see. But we have them. And the last thing we need is criticism. Have a word that builds people. Lifts them up. And for those of you who think, let me stay home, remember this, your presence may be a blessing to someone. Amen. Are you with me? By staying away, you deprive someone of the blessing of your presence. Come to church. Come with your mask, come with whatever, your medication, come to church. And let the Spirit of God unite us as one family. God bless you. If God arranges, I'll be back someday. If not, let's all make it to the kingdom by God's grace. Amen. So we can all live in the same neighborhood. Can you say amen? amen? God bless you and I love you.